going to introduce differential leveling. Uh, where we've been talking about radial layout, uh, traverse, these are all horizontal controls. Uh, so horizontal controls is how we lay a building out in space laterally across a site. Vertical controls have to deal with where we are elevation wise. Uh, so we are working off of uh, known elevations. Right. Uh, like we said in the previous video um, on surveying, we talked about how crucial it is to know where you're at off of sea level and how we get that. Uh, it's wonderful today on the telephone, your compass, it'll tell you at what elevation you're standing. Sure. And that's handy, right? Uh, but as it pertains to construction, if that building isn't put in the right spot, Height-wise, height -wise, elevation-wise. Right, and sometimes that height-wise is maybe even more crucial depending on how much underground we have around. Sure. On Purdue's campus, it's you can't put a building in the wrong spot because if you're too low, we can't run water uphill. Yeah. And Not without mechanical systems that's right. that weren't budgeted. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. Right. Very all about expensive. The, all about the budget. Yeah. So here's the process. Uh, or, or the way that we, we locate on a, on a job site where we're at with regard to sea level. We talked in the last video that we have these datums that are all over the place, all over, gridded across the country. I don't care if you're in the Rocky Mountains, there are monuments through those mountains that surveying crews use to first establish those elevations, right? Right. The topography of the United States, that was all mapped out doing differential leveling back in the old days, man. I mean, how easy it would have been for them to do if we had drones where oh, you could sure. just fly a drone up and over and totally gives you all the topography of the ground, uh, you know, a GPS. Right. But now, you know, back when, when our grandparents were doing this, uh, they were using the old-fashioned yeah, equipment. Walking and across walking, the entire right. country and shooting elevation. Actually, my, my great-grandfather, Isaac Santon, uh, was on one of the crews that surveyed across northern Indiana and into Illinois and wow. through. Uh, yeah. That was, he was actually a surveyor. Yeah, and now you can jump on a GIS system, a graphical information or geographical information system, pull up a property and see spot elevations already called out on that piece of property. Absolutely. And you'd still have to verify, but now you already have those those rough elevations, uh, and not so rough, but you have some basic elevations that you can start to work with that's already in the system, thanks to all that work yep, that was absolutely. done you know, 100 plus years ago. Right, right, right. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna have our surveying crew put us some benchmarks in place. And a benchmark is I don't want to say it's permanent, but it needs to be put on something that's pretty permanent and won't move. All right, we don't want to use one of these. No. Or some spray paint on the ground because that can be washed away with rain. These can get knocked over by equipment, uh, a mowing crew, uh, even just a, a, a neighbor or somebody walking by knocks the stake over. We, right. It's got to be something permanent or semi-permanent so we know it's not going to go anywhere. Right. We're going to want something that's not going to heave with the frost and thaw of the ground. Sure. So if we put something in the ground, we need to get it deep enough. And in Indiana, that's going to be three feet, right? Our frost line in Indiana, most of Indiana is three yeah, foot, As we right? start in the south and work our way up north, just within our state, that line changes right. and that's in the code book. I know a lot on my job sites and my job sites tend to be smaller, um, you know, usually maximum of 40 or 50 acres. Um, the surveying crew will set a benchmark maybe on a telephone pole yeah. that's already on the side of the road on our side of, you know, our project side of the road and drive a great big mag nail into the telephone pole 
at a height, flag it, paint it, and when I get the data, it tells me what the height of that or elevation of that magnel is. We know the telephone pole is not going to go anywhere. God forbid, you know, yeah, a car right. wreck would take the telephone pole out, but in general, the telephone pole is going to be there for the duration of the job. Right, right. So that, what he's talking about is the establishment of a benchmark. And a benchmark is that known elevation. We have to have one known elevation as a starting point, but we also finish back. We call it closing the loop. As we go out and we run a level loop, we start with the benchmark, and as we come back around, we do all of our work in the field, we close back to the benchmark. So we see we should be, if we've done everything right and we're accurate, with our shots, we should come back around and the arithmetic should zero out at the end. So if they gave us a benchmark elevation of 100, or they gave us a benchmark of an actual above sea level uh, 652.4, once we run out our level loop and come back, if we started at 100, we should end at 100, or if it was a number off of sea level, whatever it is, that's where we should hit once we've run all of our math. Right. Got right. it. And that will show the error in the process. And if we come up with a couple thousandths of an inch, I mean, that's so minuscule, that's not going to hurt anything. Sure. But if we come back and we're a couple tenths, and yesterday when we showed you the engineering rod here and the chain that's uh, an engineering uh, measurement, we're in tenths, right? Tenths of a foot. So instead of 12 increments for a foot, we're using 10. So a tenth is approximately an inch and an eighth. So if we're a couple tenths off, we got a problem. Right. What are we going to do? We're going to have to go back out and reshoot everything. And find our air. Right, right. Absolutely. So the, 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 uh, today we're going to kind of show you visually how that looks, how we, how we run a level loop. There's a few things I want to start off with. So you guys kind of understand what we're doing. Uh, and there's some, some rules to it. Uh, always start off the benchmark, always finish to the benchmark. When Mark goes out and we start to shoot different elevations out here and, and record data, what we don't want to do is if, if Mark were to walk out 100 feet in a direction, and he puts his rod down and I shoot that elevation. I record the dimension. Now it's my turn to move. And we're gonna show you this process. I move 100 feet from you. So whatever the shots are, they have to be as equal distance as possible. Right, we don't wanna set up 30 feet away, you shoot and then it's your time, turn to move the instrument and now you go 100 feet away because we were 30 the first jump, right. 100. We want to be close to equidistance as we can. As, exactly, Okay. exactly. So, so what, we could use pacing. Yes, you could, absolutely. Brilliant. We'd, we, if that we is couldn't most chain certainly, it. they are pacing out. We wouldn't run a chain. I mean, that'd be inefficient. Sure. But yes, you're absolutely right way to tie that in because that is one instance where we are definitely going to use pacing. Okay. Very good. Okay, Mark, why don't you go locate our benchmark and I'll tell the kids what we're doing and then I'll relocate once I shoot you. Sounds good. Okay. Boom. Okay, so what we're going to do is we've set up on the sidewalk and we're going to show you a series of steps. The first step is to shoot to the benchmark. So you have an, in, I, I shouldn't say it. The first step is set the, your, your instrument setup. And unlike setting up over a hub, it doesn't matter. Okay, okay we'll just set up in space. We've set up uh, the instruments leveled. Mark's gonna travel to the benchmark. The benchmark, we're gonna use a manhole cover in the sidewalk, that's a because it's permanent. It's, it's not permanent, going anywhere, right. or at least semi-permanent while we're building the job. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pace from the instrument yep. because I'll need that a little in one of our future steps and have a rough distance away uh, to where our instrument is set up from the benchmark. Right. So I'll ask you guys to refer to the uh, surveying textbook to look at uh, your, your, your field notes and how to keep those. Uh, We'll go over it in class, of course, 
Uh, we're not going to go too much into it today. I'm just going to tell you what the nomenclature is. So what we're shooting is we're shooting the benchmark, okay? So I'm going to find mark. So Scott, would this be considered our back shot? Yeah. So you can see how Mark is waving the rod. He's bringing the rod into him and he's taking it away from him. And what we're doing is, if you think about it, if, if that rod isn't perfectly plumb, both directions, east, west, north, south, then we're not going to have a true reading on the stick. Remember, our instrument's level, he needs to be plumb with the stick. So as he moves the rod, at its, when it's perfectly plumb, is the lowest number we're going to register. So I shot 6.2 feet. As he dips that rod, that rod comes back to him, that dimension was going 6.22, 6.23, 6.24. And then as he came back, it starts to drop back down to 6.2, and as the rod comes into him, it starts to climb back up. So the 6.2 being the smallest number is the one that we want. Because remember, when we tip something, just think about it. Think we're good is, and as I tip, what happens? That dimension gets longer, reads more. So that's why Mark is waving the rod. So if you're on the rod, you're responsible to keep it plumb this way, and then we tip it back and forth, we rock it, so that the person on the instrument can get the exact measurement. Okay, you ready to move, Mark? Ready to move. So as you can see, Mark's pacing up to the instrument head. And then he's going to carry that number of paces away from us for our next shot. Now what in essence we did shooting the benchmark, we established our instrument height. So if I have a known elevation that Mark set the stick, we'll say it's 100. Mark set the stick on 100 and I shot 6.2 feet. So our instrument height, it, we take the back shot plus the benchmark. So our shot plus that benchmark gives us the height of our instrument. We need to know the height of the instrument because that's our reference point as we make our first four shot. Now Mark's on a point over here and I'm going to shoot the stick. So our four shot Okay, we shot 4.12 feet. So if I want to know the elevation of that point in which Mark has stuck the rod, I take instrument height minus the four shot, and that takes us down to whatever that equals. So the 106.2 minus the 4.12 gives us the elevation above sea level of where the stick is. Now at this point, it's my turn to jump the stick. So, Scott, so I'm going to pick up, I'll pace to mark, and then I'll go set my instrument up for the next shot in the loop. Paste 17 paces to mark from where my original setup was at to where I'm setting up now with 17 paces to him and then 17 paces to the to the new location. So now Scott is looking at his target bubble. He's getting his instrument set up so he knows that he is level. He'll then hit the button by the eyepiece in order to free the optics and then we know that we're ready to shoot. So you'll think about the sequence this is now we've essentially moved our benchmark forward. So now Scott's repeating a back shot just the way we started the sequence to begin with. We had an instrument location and he shot the back shot to our benchmark. Now we've just moved everything forward. So I am now sitting on a new temporary bench point, benchmark or a turning point. So this would be turning point one 
because we turned and flipped the instrument kind of upstream, so to speak. So now Scott will shoot the back shot once that's recorded, then I'll pace to the instrument, get the same amount of paces beyond the instrument, and Scott will move, then shoot the four shot. So we'll repeat the process of waving the wand and go ahead and get the reading and then record the Good. elevation. So Scott's already recorded it, so now I will pace off to the instrument. So I have 14 paces, so now I'll pace forward because we want to be as close to equal distance as we can. 14 paces. Now that Mark has walked out his 14 paces, I can take another shot to see what our elevation is at Mark. Four point nine two feet. Very so good. Re record okay, that in so our field book. Okay, so now that we've come to the end of our loop and we're going to start heading back home, what I have to do now is I have to make a slight instrument shift, and then we'll take and we'll head back to the manhole to close the loop. And if we did everything right, we should come back at 100. Uh, so, okay, let me do a quick, uh, I'm just gonna move to the side. So that'll give us a new instrument, height of instrument setup. Okay, now I'll pick Mark back up. So we're establishing a back shot. Scott's reading the lowest number. Okay. So then I would pace back to Scott so we can go equidistance again. Fifteen and a half. So now we'll move the same distance away. Perfect. We've shot him. Now it's my turn to skip the rod, and then we'll close the loop on the benchmark. So I'm just pivoting around. Scott will pace to my point, and then match his paces down. So he's just resetting up. He'll establish his location. So we have another turning point, and this will all be recorded in your field point. You have turning point one, turning point two, turning point three, however many you need to get back to your original benchmark. So each time he moves the instrument, we have to go back through the leveling process of the instrument and make sure that it's ready to be moved. And they'll sight back on me. We'll wave our story pole, get the reading, and then we'll be back at our original benchmark. Good. So my job when I'm on the story pole, I don't want to be leaning out to the side because that's giving us a bad measurement. You want to have the story pull out in front of you, try to be as plumb as you can and try to just do nice, long, slow movements without tipping to the left and right. We're just closing the loop so as long as we have recorded our data along the way, we can take care of our, our air with, uh, with math. 
So now I'll pace off to Scott. Scott's got his reading, so we're done. So what we did there was we just closed the loop. And as we go back inside and we started to work through all of our, our field notes, as we ran those down, we should end up back at 100. You guys will be able to see that process, the arithmetic, that'll be in course lectures, and then we'll have, you'll, you'll, you'll get a little practice doing it. Okay. And in our field book, <clears throat> in our notes, if we were doing this as professionals, we'd record everything, who the crew was, uh, obviously your location, time of day, the weather. Uh, we'd draw a, a, a map where we knew where north was, where our turning points were, so that if someone wanted to come out and repeat exactly what we did, we've, we've kind of drawn them a treasure map with all the notes necessary so they can repeat our work. Right, right. The most important aspect is consistency, and you can never have too much data. Because what happens is, is we lose hubs out in space, right? Backhoe may hit it, whatever. It's nice when we have precise mapping to where all these you know, hub locations are so that if something happens, we can go back out using their notes, see their process, and what that elevation was. Absolutely. I can't tell you how many times in 30 years that uh, we've had a, <clears throat> a property surveyed uh, at least just to find the perimeter and then establish a few benchmarks so we can do our building layout. It's all done, looks great. We come out two days later to start doing building layout and the stakes have either been pulled from the ground, they've been knocked over, or we can tell someone's picked them up and moved them. And usually that happens with a neighboring property owner that says, I know my property line is here. Well, they don't. They right. just know where they've mowed to or where they've maintained. Uh, and the surveyor brought that data forward and found the exact property line. That's why they're licensed. That's why they stamped the surveying uh, documents right. uh, to ensure that that is the location we're supposed to be. You bring up a good point with legality. What the plat says is the legal application of that map. Right. Doesn't matter what the homeowner wants or what the other homeowner, it's what the county says, what's recorded at the uh, uh, assessor's office and the engineering office. Per those plats, that is the legal description of the property. Sure. And that takes precedence where? In court. In court. Yep. And you wouldn't believe how many people think they know where their property lines are and they don't. Right because maybe over time that they've mowed a little further, mowed a little further, maybe it was an empty lot next to them, uh, and they think their lot is 10 feet lo longer or wider than it is, or deeper than it is, or maybe both. Right. And then a construction company comes in to build on that piece of ground, and that can lead to some uncomfortable moments. But if you have data on your side that's right and you have a recorded record of what you've done that's what you need to prove this is where we're supposed to be absolutely